Now, when I was a child, I always wanted to be king. Uh, if I'm honest with you, whenever it came to the nativity play or anything like that, uh, not king of like, England or Scotland or Wales or anything like that, I always wanted to be the king in the nativity play. But for some reason, I was always picked to be the shepherd. I don't know if I've got a shepherd-like face or, or something like that. I must have a sort of rustic look, uh, I think. But uh, when I was older and I started going to church occasionally, uh, my parents didn't go at all and they, they just used to sort of turn up. They always picked me to be Joseph. Uh, but I wanted to be a king. The closest I got was uh, playing King John in a pantomime when I was 11. Photos exist, uh, but my wife Caroline only got to see them several years after we got married, uh, so don't get your hopes up. But the account we usually look at with kings is in Matthew's Gospel, where there's the classic ones, you know, the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh. But this year we're in the Gospel of Luke. But did you notice in that last readings that we've got three kings mentioned there too? Not the classic ones, but sort of alternative kings. So this morning we're going to look at the alternative three kings as we step into Bethlehem. And the first one that we see this morning is King Augustus. Uh, let me read to you again verses uh, 1 to 3. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went out to be registered, each to his own town. Our passage opens up with the king of the Roman Empire, Augustus Caesar, who declared himself a king of the Roman world. Augustus was the first Roman emperor. He was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. He proclaimed Julius Caesar a god, and he called himself the son of God. He also gave himself the title Augustus because uh, his real name was Gaius Octavius, but Augustus meant the Great One. And he saw himself as the Great One, the great ruler of the greatest kingdom that the world had ever seen, the Roman Empire. And he was so proud that he even named something after himself that we still have this day. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Augustus? Go on, yeah? August. August. The month of August, he named it after himself because he was like, oh, that's my favourite month. Uh, we should have that so everyone will remember how great I am. If he was part of Christmas lunch, he would be the turkey. You know what I mean? Right in the centre, crowd, centre stage. And apart from that, Augustus was known for his reforms to taxation. That's a bit unexciting, isn't it? He charged a sort of poll tax to all the people who lived outside of Rome. And to work out how much could be collected, he set up censuses across the world to count people to see how much he could get out of them. So humanly speaking, the events that follow were actually there in the first place to put cash in the pockets of a Roman emperor. To make it easier, Judea, the area we're talking about, was put in the larger region called Syria. That's why we get Quirinius mentioned as the governor of Syria. And it was strange, though not unheard of, to have people travel from where they lived to their hometowns for a census. Judea, though, is probably a bit of a special case. The region was very explosive, and when they tried it the normal way a few years later, they actually ended up with riots, full-scale revolt. So making them go to their hometown was probably a sneaky way to make it seem like they were doing something else, uh, something like the year of Jubilee, which the Jews had, where they all went to their home uh, town. Whatever it was, part of this the global decision made miles away in a foreign city by a foreign king. He had no idea what events he was setting off into action. And Luke, the writer of this account, wants us to see this has all been put in place. He wants us to see this is real history in real time with real people that we've heard of. He's not recounting a fairy tale. This is not once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away. These are real people with real history. It's not Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones. Some people might doubt the miraculous nature of what's going on. But no serious person who looks into history doubts that there really was this child born called Jesus around this time in this region. Someone who was killed by the Roman authorities for the ideas that he proclaimed. He was a real person, whatever else you want to make of him, just as Augustus was real, as sure as August is August. And this real King Augustus has no idea the chain of events he's setting off. 
He demanded that his people be counted to fill his greedy pockets. That it will see prophecies that have lied dormant for hundreds of years finally coming to pass. He has no idea how his big plan to further his own schemes is actually going to be used by God to further his big plan for his plan for the universe. So King Augustus counts his people, but he didn't count on what would happen next. The next king to get name checked is King David. Let me read you verses 4 and 5. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Here we're introduced to Joseph, and we're told that his family come from someone called David. Now all of us know a Dave, though it's one of those universal things. If you want a bit of a laugh over Christmas, Google uh, a song called uh, I've Got a Friend Named Dave. Uh, it's quite a funny one, sort of everyone's got a friend named Dave. But this is a very specific Dave, in fact he's mentioned a couple of times because we're told that they've gone to the city of David. He's sort of name dropping this David again and again. It's a bit like those people who when they've met a celebrity manage to sort of get it in every conversation. But they sort of met this celebrity. I'm quite lucky really, the best I've ever seen is the back of Stephen Fry's head. That's about my only claim uh, to fame, that's a whole other story. But why is Luke name dropping this guy, David? Well, David was a king who lived a thousand years before Jesus. He was the one that you might have heard of who fought Goliath, that nine foot one man army, armed with only a slingshot and some stones. King David went on to be Israel's greatest king. He was the great king of all. If he was part of a Christmas lunch, he'd be goose. Right? Everyone knows it's the classic, but it's not really around anymore. You know, it's sort of moved on. But the nation was the largest, the richest, the most powerful it had ever been because of him. The son Solomon reaped the benefits of what he did, but David was the man. He was the king to whom all the other kings were compared. He was the gold standard. But more than that, David had been promised by God that one of his descendants would sit on the throne forever. That they would rule Israel and the rest of the world for all time and that their kingdom would know no end, and that he would be called the Son of God. A prophet called Micah even said that this future king would be born where David was born in Bethlehem. That's the reading that we had just before. And that's where Joseph and Mary must travel, back to Bethlehem, just in time for Jesus to be born. Now, to say Bethlehem was a little town is a bit of an uh, understatement, really. Uh, by our standards today, it would be barely a village. It had a kingly reputation, but it wasn't a kingly size. It's a bit like Hastings or Windsor. Historically significant, but not a huge place. <coughs> there are mainly only 300 to 500 people live there. So that makes it about the size of Western, that you go on the back road to Ilkley, about that size. Uh, the chances of being small born there were very small. I mean, Otley's got 15,000 people. And yet, that's where he was born. Early Christians apparently appealed to the Roman records to show it, since they'd had a census there that showed that he was there. But do you see what this is trying to show us? Do you see what we're supposed to be asking ourselves? Could this be the one? The one born to rule forever? The one who will sit on David's throne and rule the nations? The son of God who was promised long ago? <coughs> well, here is King David's great, 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 great grandson arriving in Bethlehem with his pregnant wife. So, he's in his own town. Surely he'll be received by the people that are there. Well, not exactly. And so our last king to be name checked is Jesus, King Jesus. Let me read to you again verses six and seven. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Here is the greatest king of all, born among animals. No room for him in Bethlehem, no crib, only an animal trough to be laid in. It's the equivalent probably of those parents who don't have a cot or a crib, so they put their baby in a drawer. You sort of hear those stories periodically where, you know, they put, maybe you've done it yourself, I don't know, I'm not judging. Um, but it's, it's uh, here is the greatest king of all, greater than David, and yet here he is in these humble settings. David ruled only Israel and then died around 1000 BC. 
that this king would go on to be acknowledged as king over all the world, with millions, billions of followers. He died, but he rose again three days later to take up his throne in heaven, and one day he'll return to take up his throne here. He's far greater than the King David that we saw. But he's also greater than Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus was the self-proclaimed son of God, whereas Jesus was the God-proclaimed son of God. An angel proclaimed it to Mary, and God himself proclaims it when Jesus is baptised 30 years later. You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Gaius Octavius was proclaimed Augustus, majestic, the great one. But Jesus was given the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Caesar Augustus wanted to show the world how great he was by counting his people. But the true king showed how great he was by becoming one of his people. He was not only figuratively the son of God, but the son of David. He was actually the son of God, God stepping into history, coming on a rescue mission to save mankind. And many great kings down through the ages have had their subjects lay down their lives for them. But this king was even greater. He laid down his life for his subjects. But in Bethlehem, there was no space for him. Even among his own people, they didn't have room for him. We're told the same in John's Gospel. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Right from day one, he was cast out even by his own people. If he was part of Christmas lunch, let's face it, he'd probably be the Sprouts, wouldn't he? Rejected by most, unloved, overlooked. Imagine that though. He comes to his own, and his own reject him. And some of us know the pain of rejection. Most of the time, the person who feels it most is the person who's rejected. However, in Jesus' case, it's the people who reject him that lose out. Those who ignore him, who miss out. Jesus, we read, is the source of all that is good and true, light and love. To reject him means that we lose out on that and cast ourselves into the darkness. But it's not even just that. He is King Jesus. And to reject the rightful king puts you in an even worse position, subject to the king's justice. Now you might be thinking, why am I telling you this? It's a family carol service. But because in the darkness, the light shines even brighter. You see the diamond most clearly on the blackest of backgrounds. When we see the problem that we all have, the good news of a solution shines all the more brighter. That verse that I read before from John, it finishes like this. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So he takes us from subjects to sons, to part of his family. This Jesus who was rejected by his own comes to welcome us into his own family, to adopt us, uh, those who receive him. How do we receive him? Well, to close, the Bible has a simple answer. Turn and trust. Turn. Stop trying to be like King Augustus, thinking you're in charge of everything. Put Jesus in charge instead. Stop trying to do things your own way without God and listen to what Jesus has to say. Determined to stop doing those things that displease God and ask him to forgive you for the things that you have done. We're to turn and we're to trust. What it's called, they're believing in Jesus' name. Not believing like we believe in Santa, but more like when you say you believe in yourself. Only it's not believing in yourself, it's believing in Jesus. Instead, <clears throat> trusting in him. Trusting in what he did at Christmas and Easter to rescue us and to bring us into his family. So I don't want to be king anymore. I'm quite happy with Jesus being king and all that goes with that. I'm quite happy to let him wear the crown. But will you give him the crown this Christmas? Trust and turn. If you want to know more about that, can I suggest three ways that you could do that? Very briefly. First of all, there are some booklets at the back. If you want to grab one when you leave, they're completely free. Uh, just to have a read over it. You can read it in the Christmas uh, Trimbo Limbo. You know that bit between Christmas and New Year when you sort of, you've got a lot of chocolates but not a lot else to do. Grab one of those as you leave. Also, we're here every Sunday morning at 10.30. You're really welcome, uh, any of, uh, anyone, to come along and join us. We love having visitors uh, with us. And then sometime in the New Year, we're hoping to run a Christianity Explored course. If you want to know more about that, it's just basically looking at the basics 
of Christianity. If you come and speak to me afterwards, uh, we'll see if we can sort that out for the new year. But don't be like me as a child. Stop trying to be king and come to Jesus instead.